Indeed. One of your cats to help us with the Jabber moderation, please. I would like to sign them up, but they're a little bit uh, lazy at the moment. I think I have one on the floor here and one on a chair sitting in the back. Hey, Brendan. Good morning, everyone. Looks like we're at the uh, appropriate time. Maybe we should get started. Yeah, we're waiting for Dave to put some slides up. The other Dave. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, so apparently it didn't work. <laughs> okay, so you're gonna put the slides up now? <laughs> yeah, I had it up and as soon as I logged on to a second machine, it stopped sharing on the first one, so. Ah. Uh. All right, can you see my screen? I can. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, The, uh, this is the SUIT uh, working group at ITF 109. Next slide. Uh, by, by this point of the week, you should probably have seen uh, Notewell many times. Uh, please, if you're going to contribute in any way, make sure you're aware of these uh, rights, privileges, and responsibilities. Uh, next slide. Um, blue sheets are taken care of uh, by Medico. Um, do we have a note taker? Somebody take notes within the Code EMD tab, please. We really need someone to do this. I can I can uh, take some notes. It's Thank fine. you very much. Is that Hannes? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I will watch the jabber. Dave, your screen went away. Did we lose Dave? I don't know why it's the way. Oh, it's the infinite tunnel. Yes, yeah, the infinite yeah, tunnel. Because I have to go back to that screen in order to publish again. So if it goes away again, I can hear you, Russ, but for some reason it stopped sharing in the middle. So uh, call me out if that happens again. Okay. Uh, can I, we I go back to the uh, the slide after note well, please? <laughs> All right, good. No, I think we just sorted that. Next one. Okay, so... Uh, this is the agenda for today. Um, we basically have two documents that uh, are out of the working group. And so we have them on the agenda just to discuss any issues that are raised either by the ISG or uh, the IETF last call. Uh, then uh, we'll turn to the suit manifest. Uh, we have a few open issues and the, the goal is to get that ready for uh, working group last call. Um, and then we have two uh, non-working group uh, documents that we uh, will get to if, uh, if time allows uh, the, with the goal of uh, seeing if they're ready for working group adoption. Next slide, please. 
And this is the uh, milestones for the working group. We're behind on the uh, manifest document that uh, should have been done um, in March 2020. Um, obviously, the world has changed since March 2020, but uh, we will hopefully be able to sort out the, a great deal of that today. I think that's so. The uh, the question is: Any agenda bashes? Okay, uh, hearing none. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the uh, uh, architecture document. I think I think Dave is going to lead that. Is that right, Brendan? I think Brendan. Gosh, I don't okay. Care. All right. I, I'm Over happy either way. Uh, okay, are you going to share, or is uh, Dave going to run it? I I have all the slides. As long as you can see the slide, can you guys see the slide right now? Yep. Okay, yep. then I'm happy to run stuff if you just want to tell me next slide, next presentation, whatever, Brendan. Okay. Okay. Over uh, to Brendan. All right. And, unless you have so, any updated slides, I, I'm still using the, the the batch that you sent me earlier. So. Yeah. No, it's nothing's changed since then. Okay. Go for it. Right, so uh, suit architecture has gone through IESG evaluation and mostly we've got um, just a relatively few number of comments. The, uh, the ballot positions have all been no objection, uh, typically no objection with comment. Um, mostly this is a, a quest uh, well, surrounding questions around the clarity of um, what's required in the architecture versus what is a requirement of the serialization. So we just need a, a couple of words here and there to make it clear exactly where the requirement lies. Um, the one thing that came up, which I think we probably need to address is whether any of the uh, documents that we reference should be normative references. Now, my concern here is, I, I, as you can see, there's a few references we make to other um, drafts that are ongoing. Uh, if we're not careful here, we're going to make quite a big cluster. So I, I guess the question I've got is whether any of these documents are actually normative to the content of the suit architecture, or whether all of these documents should be left as informational or to be more specific as forward references for places that the content of the architecture becomes relevant. So that's really the summary. Uh, I, I personally think that what we should do is leave the references as informational. Uh, I don't think any of these are actually normative to the uh, content of the architecture itself. Yeah. This is uh, Dave Thaler. I agree. Sorry, I can't put myself in queue while I'm presenting, but uh, I, I, yeah, I agree with that. Go on. Um, this is Russ. I uh, agree as well. The only one that I question is the uh, RATS architecture. Um, but I, I think it, I think it uh, informative is fine. It'll be um, an informative. So all the architecture documents. Uh, suit, teep, and rats will all be informational, so an informational reference should be fine. Yeah, so m my rationale for even the rats architecture, I so teep depends on suit and rats, um, but I don't believe that rats, that, that, that suit depends on teep, it's only the other direction, and I don't believe that suit depends on rats either, right? It's just indirect by teep depending on both of them, for example. So I don't think there's anything that you want to refer, refer, would refer to rats in a normative fashion for us. So I think that they're all informative. Seems fine. Uh, so let's proceed that way. Uh, I'm right. not hearing anybody uh, or not seeing anybody in Jabber uh, think otherwise and no one's in queue. So I think that's what we have. I think that about sums it up. So, ready to move on to the next presentation, Brendan? Unless there's any other questions or comments yep. on the suit architecture? I'm going to tee that up since I... Uh, um, I had, uh, maybe, this is Hannes, uh, maybe you've seen, I've just um, provided a couple of pull requests uh, in response to the ISG reviews in, in order to 
um, address some of the editorial changes. I think they are pretty straightforward, don't need any discussion. I uh, just want to let you know that uh, I acted on them. OK, so uh, the suit information model, as far as I'm aware, has actually just exited ISC, uh, IESG last call. I saw an email about last call expired and started seeing some commentary come in afterwards. So uh, that's my understanding of where it is. Um, we have only received two reviews so far. Genart said absolutely nothing other than looks fine. Um, Sector says not ready. Uh, I think that this is really a, a contextual issue more than anything else. Um, the reviewer from Sector essentially said that it didn't look like an information model to him. Um, and well, fair enough, it's not. It's an information model and a threat model. Um, and I asked if we changed the name to that, if that would fix the problem. And he said yes. So uh, I'm wondering if we should change the name to information and threat model uh, in an effort to make it clear what the content is. You're just talking about the title of the document on the front page. Literally the title of the document, yes. Yeah, OK, not the draft string file nope. name. OK, good. Just That's the what... title. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Okay. Works for me too. Um, he he also uh, drew out that the order of the sections is slightly confusing. Now, of course, what's happened here is that we originally had threats and user stories followed by requirements followed by elements. But then there was the um, the, the point that the content that the majority of people will be looking for is the element of the uh, manifest, which should then be at the front. But we didn't then put the requirements after the threats and user stories, which means that there's a kind of a zigzag in the story of the document as you go through it. And that was um, considered confusing. So should we reorder the uh, sections to go elements, requirements, and then threats and user stories? Uh, put me in queue. I don't know if other people are in queue, Russ. I think Hank is first. Uh, hi, all. Hi, Brenton. So uh, personally, I think whatever order you choose, it's the wrong one. So that's first. <laughs> I think this is a, yeah, of course. So, but this is, uh, I think that is correct. This is about people who want to understand and implement this. So I see the point IETF elements first, although, of course, that is a wrong order. Um, uh, if you inherit this wrong order, uh, you should inverse it. And that is elements requires threats. Uh, you could uh, 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 alleviate this problem by naming it threat and information model and then use the correct order. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, again, I think IETF is uh, the place where you start with the elements. And that's OK. I think, Dave, you said you were in queue. Any further yeah. comments? Um, uh, yeah. Um, my personal preference, and I agree that it's a matter of maybe it's preference, but um, I like the order that things are in right now, which gives, because uh, when we first put the things in that order, I found that it gave a natural flow, right, that says, here's the, the things we're trying to accomplish, which then these, leads to these requirements, which then leads to these solutions. So I thought that that was a fairly logical flow. So uh, Hank said one thing I was gonna say, which is um, maybe the name of the document should be threat model and information model so that it matches stuff. And then I might have the table of contents be organized such that there's a section inside the document that is called threat model, and then a section that is called information model after that, okay? 
And so that means that the title would be threat model information model, the table of contents would be structured like threat model, and then after that would be the information model section, and then the elements are in the information model section, right? And so if you only care about that, you jump to the information model section. But I think that would be less work than trying to reflow the text to make, um, uh, you know, backwards references to terms and things like that you have to fix up. And so I like nah, the order. I don't all, think it's uh, worth fixing that, but... We, we Sorry, managed what we to make them... Uh, all of the uh, references are symbolic, so uh, reflowing it's trivial. Yeah. So anyway, I like the order that it is right now, but I would change the title and the uh, uh, table of contents, uh, you know, section ordering, section labels, I should say, to match the I threat should... model and information model terms. But it's just a matter of preference, right? So I should probably clarify that what we have right now, the order is elements, then threats, then requirements, which is why I say there's this oh. bit of a zigzag at the moment. Okay, sorry. I thought, was that a change? That was a change, yes. That okay, wasn't what was the original change. That change happened a long time ago. Okay, what was the original? Refresh my memory. The original was threats, requirements, information elements. Okay, that's the one that I remembered in my head, um, <laughs> yeah. which that order is the one that I was saying that made sense to me when I first read that version of the document, is yeah. that particular order. That version is the one that tells a story. Yeah, it makes perfect yeah, sense. Exactly. I like that way. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, so, as as Hank correctly points out, the IETF is a place where people, you know, come not to learn about the threats to their devices, but how to implement things. Yeah. So it's a matter of preference. I don't feel strongly either way. So. Okay. So I mean, I would be happy to uh, change it to threat and information model and stick the information elements at the end. I just thought it was interesting that both Hank and I both suggested that. I don't know what the rest of the working group thinks, but. Uh, Does anyone have any strong opinions on this? So what is the, what is the proposal from Hank? Uh, threats and then requirements elements or which order? I just for the meeting minutes. Um, so yeah, this is Hank again. In the minutes, yes. So the, the 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 story that Brent was talking about is threats, then deriving requirements from threats, and then uh, satisfying them for the elements. And that that is the story. Yes. Which was the original story in the first version of the draft is what Brent was explaining. Yep. Sounds like people like the story. All right, let's go back to the story version. <laughs> But but make it clear in the you know in the table of contents that if you want the elements, yeah. here's where to jump. And you could even put a sentence in the introduction. If you're an implementer, <laughs> jump to C section, you know, C section five yeah. or whatever that would be. So yeah, I'm uh, as in the uh, manifest document, uh, having a how to use this document is probably a good thing. Yeah. All right. Um, then there were a, a couple of nits on um, the the use of required versus optional as applying to serialization. So essentially, what's going on here is that the information model is saying that a uh, the support for a particular um, information element must exist in a in any given serialization format, but that it is optional to use in any given manifest. So you have a strange uh, conflation of required and optional in the same element. And there were a couple of places that that cropped up and the reviewer felt that it would be helpful to clarify exactly what was required and what was optional. So I, I think that one's relatively straightforward. The only other thing that came up really in the review was a question about whether there is some canonical source of a reference to the stride uh, threat modeling methodology. And that the one that we currently have in there may not be sufficiently canonical and might cease to exist at some point in the future. Remind me, which one do we point to right now? Do we point to the Microsoft source, or what's the what, what's what's the destination reference right now? We are pointing to a Microsoft source. Um, I, I don't know if it is 
you, you know, if there's any guarantee that it will continue to live where it currently is. Uh, the uh, hold on, I'm just loading the uh, the exact okay. location. Yeah, I, offhand, I don't know of a more canonical uh, reference. I don't know if somebody else does, but the Stride module model originated from Microsoft, but it's not Microsoft specific anymore. But I don't know of a yeah. better reference right now. So the one that we're pointing to, uh, just sorry, one moment. is uh, we're pointing to one that is coming from MSDN. So I, I don't know if we're going to get any more canonical than that. Right. All right. There might be a button that, showing up in somebody's uh, book that's been published or something like that. Yeah. But uh, that the MSDN might be the best mm -hmm. online reference that exists. But uh, like I said, I yeah. suspect it's shown up in one or more uh, physical publications. I think the concern is that it's at something that's hanging off of MSDN library with a, a variety of, of alphanumeric characters followed by an ASPX. And if Microsoft chooses ah. to reorganize the site, it might disappear. Gotcha. Um, if it would help, so Microsoft has the ability to create short links like aka.ms slash whatever that, uh, well, maybe it's called an FW link. So there's a number of things that when Microsoft publishes references to its own MSDN things, it uses something that it can uh, redirect if MSDN ever changes that structure. So if it would okay. help, I can find out if there is one. If not, I can get one created that is a stable link that even if the structure changes, the link itself would still be, uh, would be still, would still be stable. I think that would be helpful. Um unless there's some relatively canonical reference outside of Microsoft that's likely to be more stable. I, I, I don't know what the right answer is here. So I, I yeah. defer to people with more experience in these references. Yeah, maybe somebody in the working group will post one in the Jabber or on the list or whatever, but otherwise I can do the fallback and get a what what uh, MSDN calls an FW link, which is, is always a redirector to the actual page. Yeah, I think that, uh... It would be a benefit not just to suit, but the entire community to be able to reference that. Okay, so uh, Hannes, put that in the minutes that I have an action item, unless somebody else beats me to it with a better reference. All right, I think that's it for the information model, unless there are any further comments. Okay, so let's go on to the manifest. Thread modeling um, book, uh, the Wiley book um, by Showstack um, that talks about stride. We could maybe point to that. I'll, uh... I posted an Amazon link in the chat. Sorry, I might've missed my window, but um... I was just curious, Dave, where, when you talk about this an open information model, where are you specifying this would be um, set up and specified? Sorry, I didn't understand who that was a question for and what the question was. Can you repeat? I'm sorry, David, the question's for you. Question was, is when you said what, we're gonna define this in a standard data model, uh, where is this defined? And where can I download the schema to understand it? I don't think we ever used the term data model any time in this meeting. Uh, so I don't well, my apologies question. if you didn't, but uh, the way I represented your what you presented, the, there would be a standardized data model for how I can understand at least a schema for how Suite communicates. Ah, in that sense, the data model is the document that we're showing on the screen right now that we're about to talk about, the Suite manifest. And that's it. Oh, it's so file I'm, I'm just cleaning up. Okay, that's cool. Sorry about that. I, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. Now I think I understand your question, and that is this document that is that we're going to spend the bulk of the time on. Well, actually, in, in I hope that it's not going to be that uh, complicated. But it, uh, I mean, no, but if you go back to the other ones, count. it were only a single slide. So <laughs> <laughs> this one has more than one slide, though. Oh okay, no! Go ahead. All right. 
Shall we, uh, shall we get started then? Yeah. Okay, so there are a few technical changes, um, but they are relatively minor. There's only one that might be considered breaking, and that is separating the digest out from uh, Cozy Sign and Cozy Mac. Previously, that was the payload of the Cozy object or Cozy structure, I mean. Uh, the rest of these are additions, and they are hopefully relatively straightforward. Uh, so let's move on. Next slide, please. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so first off, private enterprise number. There was some discussion in IETF 108 about using uh, private enterprise numbers rather than the uh, UUID-based vendor IDs. So um, what I've done is looked at what options we have for encoding a private enterprise number. Now, since private enterprise numbers are actually OIDs that are relative to the, uh, the IETF uh, private enterprise number OID, it seemed like the best thing to do was retain those semantics. So since uh, IETF or CBOR tags OID has cropped up, uh, it seemed like this being an, a CBOR document having a, a CBOR representation of an OID was probably the right answer, especially given that we have a, a tag for a relative uh, OID. Now, what I've done is I've gone one step further than that, and I have asked uh, the authors of that draft to also include a specific tag for a pen. So what that is, is semantics that are almost identical to the relative OID, but because they are uh, understood to be relative to the private enterprise number OID, they actually resolve to a full OID because we already know what that prefix is. So now we have a way to encode not just the numeric pen, but the any sub-assignments that might show up as well. So the, the change here in CDDL terms is shown below. What we've added is the option of specifying a pen instead. Now, because a UUID is a byte string and a CBOR pen is a tagged value, this is relatively straightforward to understand. Mm -hmm. So that is, so next slide, please. This has some ramifications. Um, uh, for class ID. So the way that class ID was supposed to be constructed was to use the UUID version of the vendor ID as a UUID namespace and then derive the class ID from any class specific information and that UUID. But that's not going to work if the vendor ID isn't a UUID. So what I've done is provided a canonical way of converting a uh, a, a pen to a UUID so that you can then derive a uh, class ID from it. So what this requires is the the pen as uh, with the tag all of that as the CBOR pen element that's uh, listed down below and it requires a namespace for those. So for the namespace, next slide please, Next slide, please. Oh, there we are. Um, five, yeah. Yeah. So the uh, way that the the namespace ID is defined is by going through and um, constructing a namespace ID from the existing OID namespace using the CBOR OID encoding of the private enterprise number. Uh, it seemed like the uh, most sensible thing to do, but in actual fact, all that's really necessary is that uh, UUID at the very bottom. It doesn't actually matter what the value is, as oh, long as it's I, unique. I, I think this matches our discussion at IETF 108 from my recollection that this looks good. I think this matches what we had discussed uh, okay. was the direction to you to do. So. so that is all done now. Um, next slide. So um, 
we also discussed at IETF 108 the idea of removing the suit mm -hmm. digest mm -hmm. from the COSI payload and making it the first element in the, uh, the suit auth list. Now, the reason for this is that it could show up multiple times if the uh, COSI sign one or COSI max zero uh, objects are used and, and there's more than one signature. It could also show up multiple times if the uh, COSI sign or COSI MAC parameters are incompatible, uh, meaning that you can't just add another signature to your existing sign one, or sorry, existing COSI sign. Uh, what this does mean is that it enforces that each manifest can have only a single canonical digest with a single uh, choice for what the what type of digest it is. So that means that you can't refer to a given manifest with both a SHA-256 and a SHA-384. That would be invalid because the, mani the, the digest that shows up in that manifest would be one or the other, not both. This is actually convenient in one respect. Uh, I can see how it might be uh, disadvantageous if you want to be able to uh, have two different versions. Uh, however, when it comes to dependency handling, being able to identify one dependency by one digest is probably the right thing anyway. So specifying that there is only one canonical way to refer to each manifest is actually a benefit. Um, however, what it does mean is that if you have two recipients that don't support the same digest parameters, there's no way to send an identical manifest to both of them. I think that's a, a bit of a corner case. I don't think I'm overly worried about that particular problem. So I think this is probably fine. Um, the, the change to serialization is essentially that item zero in the suit auth list, uh, signature list is what I've written here, um, is a suit digest and all subsequent elements are some form of cozy authentication structure, either sign or Mac or sign one or Mac zero. Um, so Matthew, that, you, your hands up, is that about this or is that an old hand? Apologies, it's still up. So if you click the hand again, it'll take your hand down. But I clicked it twice. Well, it's up right now. Sorry. Now it's down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank yeah, you. My, my apologies. I'm not trying to disrupt. I just my my mistake. My apologies. Oh no worries. So I think that's the. Um, that that's it for the uh, removal of suit digest. What it means is essentially that we're using the cozy authentication structures in detached mode. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I've added in two Cbor tags. I don't know if these are the right values, but uh, the the argument I'll make is that suit envelope is likely to show up um, on especially in constrained connections far more often the suit manifest with uh, as, as a bare item. And as a result, I think that we should uh, preferentially aim for a smaller value on envelope than on manifest. Uh, now that said, we have a structure that's usually around 300 bytes, including signature. So uh, quibbling over a two byte tag, I think is probably unnecessary. And I would be happy with a three byte tag so uh, we could probably go over the 256 boundary without really much noticeable cost. Uh, and knowing that many of these tags are uh, in short supply, I, I don't see a problem with that. So maybe we should change that. If, if anyone has a particular uh, idea on, on what tag value we should look for, I, I know that choosing uh, tags that resolve to ASCII characters is popular. Um, then uh, perhaps we someone has a suggestion. Sure, sure. I'm I'm just waiting for someone to pop up and say, ah, pick this one. But maybe I'll uh, leave that to the list. <laughs> 107 looks like IoT. 
Oh, there we go. I like it. Except it's uh, that's below 256. We were saying we could probably get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to see if 107 is free. I, I, I don't care. All right. Uh, well, let's let's move on. In any case, uh, we've also added index lists. Now, this is just an extension of the original index equals true semantics. So the idea being that when index when the the in either the dependency index or the component index was set to true, then it would apply to all components or dependencies respectively, uh, or each each individual command would reply would apply like that. Uh, so this adds a new semantic, which says uh, that you can provide a list of indices to which all subsequent commands apply. Uh, this is important for any device that has more than two uh, non-identical or non-identically handled components. Uh, so if you can imagine a device where it has loadable components, then being able to say load all of my components that are loadable would be useful, given that some of your components will not be loadable, namely the destinations of those loads. So if you have two components that need to be loaded into RAM, you want to be able to say load my two components into RAM, not load component A, load component B. And the difficulty with the index equals true semantics is that the destinations of those loads would not themselves be loadable and the commands would not apply to them. So what this does is gives you the opportunity to say load component one, load component two, but don't load three and four because that's where the loads are gonna wind up. Uh, this required a little bit of thinking through what it means for the try each and run sequence uh, commands. And, and what that essentially means is that uh, we had to properly document exactly what the semantics are when you use one of these uh, multi-component indices on one of those command sequences. And what, what it means is that they shouldn't actually know that that's what's going on. The content of the command should not be aware of this. Instead, the command as a whole should be run once with each possible index, regardless of whether that's the index equals true semantics or the index equals list semantics. They should only ever get the numeric indices. So that's now been clearly defined in the uh, document, which should lead to less implementation errors, I hope. Next slide, please. And uh, we have removed suit report and it's been factored into its own draft, which I think we're coming to very shortly. Uh, so that was just, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, no, uh, all I was going to say was that it didn't have a lot of bearing on the content of the suit manifest itself, and, and so uh, it needed to be in its own draft. Uh, Dave Thaler gave us a really substantial review, which um, I don't know how much time you spent on it, but I tell you, uh, going through it and, and putting those changes in sure took me a while. Uh, <laughs> That so that that's um, that was good review and I think that the document's substantially better for it. Um, one of my my remaining um, frustrations with this document is that it is enormous, and it this is this is frustrating because it is a relatively simple concept. Uh, all all we're defining here is a bytecode interpreter and the arguments and and values it takes or essentially something of that effect. But the, the net effect is that when we get around to describing all of this um, mechanic and data format that uses, it ends up taking a fair bit of space. So if anyone knows how to cut that down, let me know. Um, one of the things I've done to try and aid clarity in the examples is removed hex printing of byte string wrapped CBOR. So now there isn't an enormous quantity of just hex printed noise in the examples. Anywhere that that would have been 
has been replaced with an explicit uh, bstring.cbor as a, as a reference back to the CDDL um, that shows the decoded CBOR inside it with no hex printing around it. Uh, next slide, please. I think that might be the end of it. Is that the end? Yeah, that's the yeah. end. Uh, I had uh, two comments. So I don't know if there's other people in queue. Doesn't look like it. OK, then I'll go ahead. Uh, so uh, I just want to report out to the rest of the working group that there was a uh, first that there was a topic that came up in TEEP that Brennan was there for and just wanted to summarize that it had to do with the use of component IDs. Um, and there's another message on the list after the meeting that Brandon and I and Hannes and folks are in. And the remember, Teep uses suit and uses rats. Okay, so it uses rats for evidence in the form of eat tokens, and it uses suit in the form of suit manifests. Um, both the evidence, meaning the eat tokens, and suit manifests have a need to uh, uniquely identify uh, software components. Um, the question was, you know, right now, as, as in, in that meeting, we said uh, the suit manifest uses a component ID, which is basically a path of, of unique identifiers. Um, and optionally, <laughs> you can also use a coswid. In the rats working group, inside the evidence, they don't have one yet, but Lawrence has indicated that they plan to put in coswid. And so the question came up and, and was discussed further on the list that says, okay, if you're a constrained device that wants to implement TEEP, do you need to implement both COSWID and component IDs? Or is should we have just one of those as mandatory, more like the suit manifest does? And if we think that, say, the component ID path is the mandatory one and COSWID is optional, then it might behoove uh, the RATS working group to take that into account when doing eat encoding. So that was the summary of that issue. Right. OK, my, my take on this um, is that suit needs to tell the manifest processor where to put something. That's, exactly. You don't have a Suit doesn't uh, have a choice. There's no choice here. Um, so yeah. suit will always have a component ID. Correct. It may also have a coswit. Right. And, so and indeed, it may yeah. not have the COSWID on the end node. That might have been severed, and it might be that infrastructure still has access to it, but the end node does not. Yeah. My take would so, be that keeping the component ID in RATS is probably necessary anyway. Yes. No, I think you and I are in agreement. I think if the rest of the working group agrees, and this may be a suggestion to the uh, EAT authors to be able to allow a suit component ID, which you have to use anyway, as opposed to forcing the use of a Coswood since they haven't decided yet, so. Well, there is another option there, which is to report the manifest digest itself. Okay, my point is, this is really a rats discussion. I'm just summarizing it to suit because I think Brendan and I and Hannes all concluded that suit doesn't need any changes. Okay, uh, so that was the first topic. And the second topic I just wanted to tee up because I posted it to the list. Uh, hold on. And Dave, it hasn't really been discussed Hank. in the list, which is the, the uninstall question. I think we've got Hank here who probably wants to talk about COSWID. Okay, like I said, I can't see the queue. So please, somebody else manage queue and. Go ahead, Hank. OK, hi. Hi, this is Hank. Um, actually, I want to talk about component ID. <laughs> so uh, there is a draft. Uh, actually, I don't know if it's expired, but it's the suit claims ID that uh, 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 Brent and I uh, aggregated. And there is a system property claim in there uh, that is actually component ID. So uh, why this is not in the each core ID, we most certainly uh, assume that this is required if you want to express this in evidence. And we have uh, two sets of uh, claims here that can be used in evidence or even at the station results. And these are the system property claims and the interpreter mm -hmm. record claims. And so uh, I am under the impression that this is already on the radar. Uh, due to uh, basically us, us having it on the radar, um, I am not entirely sure it has if it has to go into the core each draft. It could. 
uh, but it would a little bit split one item out and singular it out and that was a little bit confusing to the context maybe actually i'm i'm not really worried about that we can reference it here uh, instead of defining it here uh same same so it, it's on the radar i don't think that is a uh, issue actually So, Brendan, there's a question in chat. Oh. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, can someone remind me what SANML is? I think it stands for a sensor markup language. I think it's like a batch of values that the a way of expressing a batch of uh, values that uh, the uh, one of their IoT working groups did. Okay, um, I think it was core. I'm not sure how that. I I don't see overlap between that and suit. Right. Someone I, I don't either. I think for me what I thought that one is. of the use cases was if I have a set of temperature settings each taken over you know, 10 second period over the last hour, then I can express them all yeah. in a send ML format and send them off in one message. That type of thing, I think is an example of a use case. And again, I, yeah, I agree with you. I don't see the overlap with suits, so. Okay, uh, so so far the, the chat seems to be agreeing with that. Um, okay, all right, shall yeah, I ask my other you, question? Uh, other yeah, that? Dave, you had another question? Okay, so uh, I'll bring this up mainly because this is the draft that's overdue. And so at the expense of stealing a couple minutes from the uh, non-working group documents, I think that that's the right call is because we want to be done with this one. Yep. So the message that I posted to the list, I will summarize. The draft right now talks about how you install uh, suit manifests, whether that's installing a component the first time or updating an existing component. TEEP has to be able to install, update, and delete. Okay. Right now, the draft doesn't say anything about how you might go through any type of uh, an uninstall procedure. I think it should, um, because I would like something I could just reference in T because I can imagine multiple possible answers, and we should just pick one. So, for example, uh, the examples that I put in there, do you say, in order to delete, some, to delete a component, do you bump the manifest version number, have no payload, and put commands in there to delete it, and so it's another uh manifest version of the same component or do you assume that you can use the existing one and somehow infer what the deletion structure and commands are based on the opposites of the install or something else and i think the draft should say that's that's a fair comment um that's going to require a little bit of uh of thinking through so just to to explain where the problem lies here uh essentially the the issue that i see is that um, there's a dramatically different behavior depending on whether you've got an execute in place or, or raw flash type device or whether you've got a file system device and, and they act very, very differently. Um, the other thing is that you might not actually want to allow a particular manifest to um, delete a payload of a previous version of itself because that would, mm -hmm. That would open the door to um, a number of reliability problems. Um, so, so th that seems to me like the the TEEP use case is actually orthogonal to the um, to the reliable um, unattended IoT device use case, and that we this is going to take some very careful handling to make sure that we don't get it wrong yeah i think that the use case can come up anytime that you can have multiple independent things installed so like multiple yeah. apps installed for example right it can come up not just in a TEEP use case but anytime that you can install multiple things as opposed to say one piece of firmware that you're always overriding you have to have a piece of firmware to boot right anytime yeah. that you can have yeah. multiple things on top of that this problem can come up um, an example of a complexity in TEEP that's very TEEP specific is um, in TEEP, we used to have this notion of security domains, right? And we said, yep. well, that was pushed down to the suit manifest. If you need to create a security domain at the time that you add, a, uh, add an app that would depend on it. Well, what about if you delete that app? Do you delete the security domain or not? And you might imagine that you want that to be configurable somehow. And so exactly how do you express that? And so 
since Teep said the install problem, we were punting over to shoot and we're just going to reference it. I would like the Teep work now. Now the, the uninstall problem the uninstall. comes to. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, you, yes, you licked I, the cookie. Yep. <laughs> I see the uh, I see the challenge there. Um, I, I understand the use case. I'll, I'll okay. have to. I, I suspect okay. that the answer is that much like we've got a way to fetch something and to copy something, we need an explicit delete. Uh, I suspect that that's the answer. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons that that's important. But the thing that we definitely need to clarify is what is the behavior if you have multiple copies of something. So if you've got multiple different copies of the uh, of the TA, and you say delete right. it, but each one has a different component ID, right? Because no, the whole pack. see that's the thing. Uh, it, maybe that's true in the TEEP use case, but that's not true for all suit devices. It's fine for me to say the TLS library, and then have that selected based on which one's most recent and valid, and its manifest works. And then if something fails and I need to do a rollback, I pick the previous TLS library. And, and for that to work, they have to have the same component ID. So that becomes a challenge when I now say delete the TLS library. Which one do I delete? Well, the same thing comes up, I should say, that in TEEP, um, when TEEP has to be able to express the list of things that are installed. Mm. And right now, we in the discussion, the TEEP, we said we want to do that by component ID. Now, I think that yep. does force TEEP to always have unique ones and never have the collisions based on that yes. recommendation. That's right. OK. So this, this right, is well, something. I just want uh, to bring this up. I did post it to the list yesterday, but most people haven't seen it. But I, my belief is, unless somebody tells me otherwise in this meeting, my belief is, we don't have to have the answer right now. We just have to agree that the answer should be in the suit manifest document before we ship it to ISG. That's that's a fair assessment. Um, I will put my thoughts down in an answer to that email so that we, we keep that discussion going and, and hopefully we can come okay. to a resolution on it fairly quickly. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Uh, Is that it? Okay, so, so moving uh, to the suit report, uh, I saw no one else in queue, and I didn't see anything else in chat. So let's go. We I, uh, we have less than ten minutes. That's okay. Short document, short number of slides. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it would be nice to know what your manifest did. We could use error codes. That's what most updates do. But those often get really ambiguous and really badly defined. That's been my experience implementing one of these systems before. It's It's been really hard to actually work out what went wrong. It'd be nice if you could have a backtrace, find out exactly what happened. So if you've already got a copy of the manifest, what exactly do you need to get a backtrace of what your manifest processor did? Next, please. Well. There's only a couple of things that actually affect the execution path of the manifest. So you'd think that flow control commands would affect it, but they don't. Only, only conditions and only if they fail. And nothing else actually changes the path that a manifest takes. Next, please. So what you need to know to be able to work out exactly what your manifest processor did is the digest of the root manifest, so you've got something to refer to, the canonical URI, so you can fetch the full set of the manifest, regardless of anything, uh, of whether or not something's been stripped on the end node. The, and then for each condition failure, you need to know which manifest it was processing, the section that it was in, how far into that section it was, uh, the current manifest, uh, oh, sorry, that should say current component or dependency, my apologies, um, and the failure reason, which typically in a condition failure would be the actual value that didn't match the expected. Next slide, please. Um, there are a couple open issues with this. Now, specifically, there's um, the the question as to what happens when you've got strict order set to false and a condition fails. 
that's uh, not exactly clear at the moment, so need to work through that one. Um, and then there's a question of whether we should add an anti-replay mechanism to it. So um, that's really it. And I believe the answer to the anti-replay mechanism is yes. It should contain some kind of, of um, unique number, uh, however that works, whatever that looks like, probably a byte string. Um, and uh, the interop question is, or is still difficult. So we'll have to work through that one. There you are. As I said, short so, document, short number of slides. Yeah. So I believe as chairs, uh, this is a question to Dave and Russ. Um, should we ask for a call for adoption at this point um, as a data point for the working group, the TEEP working group uh, in the past version of the suit manifest document that had suit reports in it, the TEEP protocol took a dependency on the suit reports and referred to that. Um, and since it was split out, the TEEP protocol now refers to this document, which is not a working group document. But the point is the TEEP protocol is currently taking a dependency on it in the hopes that suit would adopt it. So that is my rationale why I think we should go ahead and do a call for adoption. I have no objection. Does anyone um, in the meeting have an objection? Do you want to do a show of hands tool? Do you just want to call, ask a question? What do you want to do? Well, does anyone object to us starting one? And if so, why? OK, I uh, see support in, in chat and no objection. So we'll do that. And uh, I think we have the MUD uh, document next, uh, but we only have four minutes. I don't know how far you can get into it. Oh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, trying to find which one is mud, otherwise I'll re-go and start again. So, so uh, just as background, right, we we've already talked about the mud one um, in IETF 108. Uh, so there's not anything new to report on it. So this is just a very quick overview. And um, hopefully that is helpful. So the idea here is that we want to deliver some MUD info in suit. Um, to do that, we need some new data in suit manifests and some new data in EAT. Next, please. Uh, the, the changes to suit would mean that we add an envelope extension. And specifically, that would contain a MUD container. Um, and we'd need to add a manifest extension to uh, integrity protect that MUD container. Uh, the MUD container itself would have uh, either a URL or a, uh, a digest or a MUD file in its entirety. Now, the digest is of the subject key identifier of a MUD signer. Uh, next, please. The change to eat would be that we need to rep uh, report a canonical URI for the manifest and a digest for the manifest. But I think we need those already anyway, so I'm not sure there is actually a change there. Uh, next, please. Or, all right, so the workflow here would be that a device attests its manifest uh, digest, its manifest URI, a software digest, and any configuration digests. Um, then, uh, the MUD manager would obtain the attestation report. Now, I'm assuming that that's already been verified and it, it acts as a relying party in this case. Uh, the, it would then retrieve a canonical manifest and validate the authenticity of that manifest. Uh, then it would validate the attestation report against the contents of the manifest and specifically against the COSWID if it's being used as a software bill of materials. Now, once that's been done, the uh, MUD manager would have a very confident view of exactly what device it was looking at. And then it can fetch and apply a MUD file with confidence that it is, in fact, the correct MUD file for the correct device and that uh, it should apply as expected. Okay, and, we've got um, less than a minute, um, so and that's the I last guess the slide. question is, do we want to adopt? 
uh, or start a call for adoption. Yeah, I think at 108, the question was, what's the right working group for this discussion? And I think we agreed then with Roman's help that suit was the right working group for the discussion. So. Right. right. I think we also had some discussion about whether we would need to recharter in order to add this work item. Um, and I think the agreement was last time that we would. Okay, so we we should start the uh, the discussion of the recharter text before we do the call for adopt. All right, we're out of time, so uh, go get your virtual cookies, and, and we'll see you uh, uh, in the last session. Maybe um, hope you've enjoyed this virtual ITF. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so, Dave Walter Meyer, you're still on. Uh, what did we? Can, so I, I'm now just looking at the chat room since I, I couldn't do that while well seeing the screen. Did we have a conclusion on the uh, stride content on the stride reference via the chat discussion? I just want to know whether I still have an action item or whether it's been overtaken by references to a book or something. Well, I I think I'd propose that we reference the Showstack book um, as a stable reference. Because I see Jennifer is saying plus one for stride book as source. I don't know if that was in response to your link. I, I think it was. OK. Um, there seems to be support for that. I have a copy of that book, um, but it's unfortunately in my office, and I don't have access to it. Uh. <laughs> but you're sure this one covers uh, stride? With a title like that, it should. But the table of contents I, I, here? I yeah, linked it does. the um, three. It does. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, I think there's multiple possible books. Uh, this one looks fine to me. If this is one that people are familiar with, it's a Wiley and a Dr. Dobbs Jolt Award finalist. Sure, uh, this one looks like a fine reference to me. So then uh, I will uh, not do my action item unless somebody tells me otherwise, if that's going to be our default answer. So. I mean, separately, I will still go and get a stable link for it, but I don't think we need to use it in the suit manifest document if Brennan is just going to pick this one up. So, I, I will take what um, what makes sense, and and I, I get that ISBNs are less likely to change than URLs. Yeah, it's just not a, not as accessible if it yeah. is not uh, if it doesn't have a link associated with, it, so not as many people can find it. Yeah, and and that's that's the difficulty. Um, so. Should we ask on the list whether people prefer a uh, book that you can only pay for or whether people prefer a non-paid uh, source? Yeah, I, I mean, this, this is the both. thing. It's, it's like, it would be nice if there were a reference back into the IETF because then then we at least can be self-consistent. Um, but well, I don't I, think I there's don't... any document in the IETF that, that's no. referenceable on that, so... Uh, maybe oh, I the, don't think... there's, there's an option that says you could reference both the book and the Microsoft source, which yeah. gives you at least one uh, paid guaranteed stable thing and one uh, free um, possibly stable reference, right? So you can do both. Yeah. Okay. So so my, my takeaway on that is that regardless of which way we end up going, it would probably be nice to know what the stable reference was. So if you're able to pull out that stable reference, that would be great. Um, okay, so and, I'll go and ahead and I'm, do my action item then and send it to you. Yeah. It, even if you choose to do the book in addition or whatever, but I'll go ahead and send yeah. it to you. So I'll still do my action item. That's what I was trying to figure out. So, yeah. all right, we'll do. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, well, I still have you. Um, Brendan, could you draft? Yeah. Um, a, f a few sentences for the charter text on, uh, uh, or at least to propose some charter text for the the suit report and and suit mud uh, yeah, drafts. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll... <laughs> oh, Dave, I think... my interpretation is the, and so I don't know if Roman is still on. Uh, he may have dropped off. I think he was on here earlier. Let me check. 
Uh, yeah, Roman is still on. Um, the uh, at the discussion of having to reach harder. Uh, my recollection, but I, is really fuzzy. But I think that did apply to the mud document. But did it apply to the report, which was already in the suit manifest before? Well, I I, th I would see no harm if we're going to go through the rechartering process to at least add work items for for both. No, it's just a sequencing question. Can we start doing the call for adoption and, and the uh, recharter discussion in parallel, or do we need to serialize them? If I remember right, the the charter text says that we will produce a uh, a serialization for a manifest format. I think that is the only actual normative information gotcha. in the charter text, which probably means that we can't do suit report without a recharter. Gotcha. Okay, so it only matters, well, not only, but it, it matters to the TEEP working group because they'll have a normative dependency on the suit report, which means TEEP protocol can't go to RFC any sooner than the suit report does. Yep. And if it's blocked behind a recharter effort, then that adds delays in the suit into the TEEP protocol, which may or may not be an issue. So. Well, this this is the the point where I think I, I would ask our area director what to do. Yeah, that's why I was looking. Roman is on, but he's this is Jabber user, so maybe he's only seeing text. Well, I think we're going to have to reach out to Roman well, we'll and ask his offline. advice. Yeah, we can follow up yeah. with him offline. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for the chairs. All right. Great. Bye, folks. Thank All you. Right. Bye.